Good morning and welcome to Rising. We have an unbelievable show for you today. I don't even believe it. Brianna, <laughs> make me a believer. What's going on? I'll try my best, Robbie. <laughs> uh, well, we'll have a fantastic guest coming up discussing the root causes of why there's so many Venezuelan immigrants fleeing the country in the first place. And we will dig into Robbie's new reporting on the end of federal vaccine and mask mandates at a Louisiana school. But first, yesterday, the Federal Reserve set in motion another rate hike in the fight against inflation. The Fed raised its key interest rate by 0.75 percentage points for the third time this year, which some say could break the dam on a recession. Here's Fed Chairman Jerome Powell making the announcement and signaling that more hikes are likely to come. The FOMC raised its policy interest rate by three quarters of a percentage point. And we anticipate that ongoing increases will be appropriate. We are moving our policy stance purposefully to a level that will be sufficiently restrictive to return inflation to 2 percent. Bank CEOs balked at the aggressive price hikes while testifying on Capitol Hill and warned that the increases could actually cause a slowdown in the economy and could put millions out of work. As Senator Elizabeth Warren said, she fears Powell is on the path to increasing unemployment in the labor market. And while Powell has signaled more hikes to get inflation down, Fed officials forecast that rates will rise to 4.4 percent at the end of this year and believe that the rate of inflation will return to their goalpost of 2 percent by 2025, which is still a long ways off. Yeah, and look, the, this discussion about how they are, are afraid it's going to push unemployment, there was an explicit commitment earlier this year that that was the goal here, that unemployment was going to bring uh, inflation down. And so we have been having this ongoing conversation, particularly on the left, about whether or not, quote unquote, saving the economy must come at the expense of the lowest tier of American workers, of working people and working families, or whether or not there are alternative ways to go about doing this. I've spoken to a number of progressive economists on my own show, and we've spoken to some here about alternatives. But it is distressing that there seems to be this openness about pursuing a strategy that is going to be so detrimental for workers, especially ahead of midterms. Yeah, I mean, look, Look, there's, there's no, this is not good. We don't want um, unemployment to rise, obviously. I mean, we want to go, some of us want to go back to the pre-pandemic economy times where we had um, a very full, very robust employment and a very healthy economy and low inflation. Um, it should be possible to accomplish all of these things at once. The, the government, you know, is no stranger to solving, trying to solve one problem, not really solving it and making a bunch of others problems worse. So. Look, I, I think it's not necessarily a great thing, but we do have to get inflation under control. Um, you know, one way to do that is simply, or one way to, even if we don't get in inflation under control on its own, we need to fix the gas prices, the food prices, all of that stuff through um, through different policy, through ending the Ukraine war, right. um, and and whatever else the administration can do, because yeah, just you know, just trying to reduce. Inflation and causing unemployment to rise again. Well, yeah, I under, absolutely understand why that's not really making the situation better overall. Yeah, that's a really great point. What do we do about the cost of food and goods? Uh, founder and Compound Capital, uh, founder and comp of Compound, sorry, Capital Advisors laid out this comparison. Two years ago, a 30-year mortgage rate was 2.87 percent, and the median home price in the U.S. was $310,000. Compared to today, where a 30-year mortgage rate is 6.02% and the median home price is $390,000, which means a $16,000 increase in down payments and a nearly 82% increase in monthly payments. Hmm. An op-ed over at Bloomberg predicts that this market volatility will largely distinguish the economic winners and losers of the decade into two groups, those who bought homes before 2022 and those who didn't, contributing to the widening economic inequality between homeowners and renters. The financial outlets also report that U.S. income inequality rose to record, uh, broke records under President, Ob uh, President Biden, according to the Census Bureau. U.S poverty climbed for a second year straight in 2021 and household income slightly dipped. Last year, 37.9 million people were in poverty, which is about 3.9 million more than in 2019. So it's, uh, it's, not a, it's not a pretty picture. So first and foremost, Robbie, can millennials catch a break? I mean, the, yeah, the, the no, we're subtext. the most persecuted generation. We we graduated, uh, you know, yes. into the recession. Um, yep. I graduated in 2010. 
was uh, how bad you, times. You, what, you graduated in like I graduated from college in 2007, yeah. started law school a month too. after the, the market yeah. crashed. And, you know, everything has, we've been off to the races since then. And not to mention, obviously, the way that COVID has now affected the generation coming up behind us. When they say things like, the have and have nots are now going to be divided up between those who bought houses um, before and those who are buying houses after this crisis. What you're really saying is that entire generational cohorts are being locked out of the American dream, not to mention all the people, obviously, from older generations who are locked out as well. And since we've based our entire uh, middle class uh, status in this country, your ability to attain middle class status on this one economic prong of home ownership, it's very curious to see what's going to happen as as interest rates continue to be driven up, as people are increasingly locked at, out, and as rents start to increase at a dramatic level, before the cause of renters was not so much of a central bedrock middle class cause in the national discourse, but as increasing portions of Americans are long term renters for life. As when you talk about middle class families, we, we were talking more about renters and not people paying mortgages. I'm curious as to whether or not we're going to have a different kind of discourse coming out of both parties. Yeah, that's true. Although, to be clear, millennials disproportionately prefer to live in areas of the country where where renting is more affordable than buying or where buying has just gotten well that's a relationship the though isn't front. it right you know i would be happy to live in various parts of the country if there were the same kind of job opportunities right. there if they were, were pay was as high there sometimes i think people talk about the idea of being able to just randomly move to the middle of oklahoma and take advantage of a 20 you know two hundred thousand dollar house there um without thinking about whether or not you can get a job there that yeah. even enables enables you to keep well but the mortgage. rise of virtual work is making that for sure. a, a lot more possible for a lot of jobs um and uh and and yeah so that's you know that's a good option for, for more people should probably do that yeah. but also it would uh the extreme like political polarization that like all like-minded people on like the blue side have have uh, coalesced in cities that, uh, from a tactical standpoint should spread out the Democratic vote to more places like yeah. Oklahoma. Look, that's why my mom, remote work, the story that exactly yeah. that you just told us, why she just moved back home to Cleveland, Ohio after 20 odd years in New York City. So uh, I know some millennials who moved to, who moved <laughs> to Ohio during the pandemic. <laughs> All right, maybe Tim Ryan uh, stands a chance. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know about that. But uh, no, I, I well, he stands, a, I, I, I'm looking, I, so I just finally pulled up the the um, the, uh, the map where you make it to make your predictions for mm -hmm. who's going to win the Senate. I, I'm still putting that one very much in the Republican box, but I don't know. We'll, we'll see. see. Look, I was a big Morgan Harper supporter. That was the progressive candidate in the primary. And if Tim Ryan doesn't, in fact, pull it out, and the argument was that Democrats had to rally behind him because he was the most electable candidate, I wonder what that does say about the messaging progressives can advance for themselves next time we're in a primary situation like this. We do have to, we have to make our maps before Election Day. <laughs> All right. Little, I'm very competitive about this. And I'm looking forward to hearing what's on your radar coming up next. <laughs> 